I think we're more or less ready to go. There'll be a few more joining us. We've got a really good turnout today, but uh, let's make a start with the housekeeping points and the like. So my name is Dave Vanix, Chief Executive of CIRA. I'm also Executive uh, Director for Build Off Site, and I take the lead um, on behalf of CIRA for the community practice for managing construction risk and net zero carbon, which you'll hear more about in a minute. Just a few housekeeping points you can see on the um, slide. Uh, we are recording the webinar and we will share the presentation slides and the recording with you at some point after the event. We will be in listen only mode. We would like you to contribute and be part of an interactive Q&A discussion at the end after the presentations have taken place. Uh, just just um, put a uh, a message in the in the chat if you've got any issues um, if you want to ask a question raise the hand and uh, uh, in the uh, usual fashion um, if you give us a, a hint in terms of uh, who the question could be answered by in terms of our uh, sort of pretty uh, esteemed um, uh, panel uh, speakers that we've got at the end uh, that would be helpful for uh, our chair Kat Ibbotson uh, to to take um, a lead from that and also um, do um, give a thumbs up if, if you think one of those questions is is really good and, and has your support and you'd really like that to be answered uh, by the panel and as you can see um, please do share resources in in the chat and share your views at the usual hashtags So I thought I'd just um, touch on um, the build of site B2B network we have for the offsite manufacturing industry, um, which um, we are representing today. Uh, Ken Davey will also uh, be uh, sharing his views from a build of site perspective, um, as well as a, a sustainability supply chain school perspective later on. Um, but just to give you the history, we set it up about 20 years ago to bang the drum to promote uh, modern methods of construction. I think it's fair to say now we are still the truly independent, trusted voice of this industry, but it's a more mature industry and we're trying to uh, preempt the particular challenges and barriers that there might still be. And one of them could be how low carbon precast concrete um, is um, perceived and how it's uh, put into practice. And we have a fantastic speaker from uh, Banners later on to talk about that. Just a quick slide on our membership, which is, um, uh, sorry, uh, the branding first. Uh, we changed it. For those who are familiar with Build Site, you might see there's a slight uh, ch chink difference. Um, those those interconnections, I think, are now more encapsulated in, in, in the icon with between uh, the clients and the offsite manufacturing industry working together, intertwined collectively and uh, collaboratively working together to deliver standardization and greater adoption of offsite. So I touched on our members, uh, very much client driven in all sectors, whether it's uh, infrastructure, housing, residential, commercial, um, social infrastructure, um, but it, even as far as wide as GSK in the pharmaceutical industry, and then the whole supply chain that supports clients in delivering off-site construction. And one of the reasons we, we have this um, uh, force assembled today of communities of practice is that Syria has a burgeoning portfolio. Uh, as you can see, Build of Site is a long-standing uh, part of that portfolio, but we, we also have um, a sustainable drainage community, and um, we also set up the um, managing construction risk community practice, which I want to just give you a few slides on. And the aim of this was really um, to bring those practitioners together who are on the one hand designing and building, but on the other hand, looking after the risks associated with that. And so I'm talking about the insurance industry. So trying to help the um, worlds that come together sometimes collide and we need to try and mitigate those risks, but we need to really um, uh, inform them better and improve their understanding of the risks um, so that we do improve performance across the board. And we've been doing this for a number of years now, looking at a number of different aspects, whether it was PII 
or design risk or uh, project insurance. And, and more recently, um, this community practice thought it would be a good idea to look at emerging materials, low carbon materials, uh, which obviously have great benefits, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also could have risks. So I'm really pleased that we've got QBE talking about that later on. And then last but not least, and uh, a good segue into um, introducing our chair, uh, Kat Ibbotson in a minute, who, who, who chairs the, um, the, the group, the Driving Net Zero Carbon uh, Community of Practice, again, set up a few years ago. We started by looking at um, past 2080 issues, uh, reducing the um, emissions in the scope three area, which was a perceived challenge, uh, but also there are definitely issues around um, uh, procurement uh, and incentivizing carbon reduction there right from the start. Uh, with clients, um, and then de-risking alternative low-carbon approaches, which again is one of the reasons why for this year, I think that might be on the next slide, for this year we've said we are going to focus on um, low-carbon materials. We had a great webinar on timber just before Christmas, and today we're talking about concrete. Steel will be on the agenda, uh, but we also want to talk about carbon tracking and calculating. And a big thank you to our supporters over the years, uh, including WSP, uh, with regards to the um, community practice, setting it up and keeping it going. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Kat Ibbotson, uh, our chair for the day. I think her details will be in the chat uh, and I can see she's appeared right on cue and uh, it's all over to you, Kat. Thank you very much, Dirk, and welcome everybody. So why are we here today? Well, the manufacture and use of cement in mortar and concrete accounts for approximately 8% of carbon emissions worldwide. So anything that can be done to reduce the roughly 600 kilograms of carbon dioxide released for every tonne of cement produced must be done. And it must be done in order to help the overall drive towards net zero. So what we have is around 30 billion tonnes of concrete that is used every year which represents a threefold increase on a per capita basis in the last 40 years. And this really is not very good news because although concrete is a versatile and long lasting construction material, it still has a significant carbon footprint. So what we find is that reducing the cement content and using alternative materials such as slag and fly ash reduces the environmental impact of concrete, but the concrete emissions are still substantial. And as coal is phased out, the supplies of fly ash will diminish and there will be an inherent risk in moving away from tried and tested formula. So what we have today is a programme of uh, key speakers, which will give you a really um, in insight in terms of the different elements of that value chain. So I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Mulholland, who is the Managing Director of Ancrete, Saeed L. Belbol, Principal Advisor and Team Leader in from uh, National Highways, who leads the Construction and Corrosion Protection Structures and VRS Group. We have Ken Davies, who's an associate at the Supply Chain Sustainability School and an industry advisor at Build Offsite. We have Andy Kane, Head of Construction and Engineering at QBE European Oper Operations. Oliver Brooks, Project Manager at Kia Group. Peter Deegan, Director at Banagir Precast Concrete. And we have Andy Powell, Innovation Manager at in the Environment Agency. So I would like to welcome uh, our first um, presenter, Andy Mulholland, who will be setting the scene on the decarbonisation task force. Over to you. Um, yeah, Andy Mulholland, uh, Amcrete UK, Chair of the Low Carbon Concrete Group. Um, uh, we're not actually going to, to uh, introduce the um, Concrete Decarbonisation Task Force because that's been superseded uh, by um, continuing with the Low Carbon uh, Concrete Group. So. Oh, it's not going very well, is it? Uh, so very quick introduction about myself. So I'm a concrete uh, technology consultant. So I work in the infrastructure, uh, civil engineering uh, sectors and provide technical support uh, and uh, indeed uh, some investigations, uh, as well as uh, being chair of the Low Carbon Concrete Group. Um, working with the CLC Green Construction Board uh, and consulting to the, uh, the climate group and, uh, and Concrete Zero. And as part of my uh, my roles, I've been inherited over the last uh, few years as being chair. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to attend uh, the IDDI conference uh, in Vienna 
to discuss uh, all things uh, low carbon. The Low Carbon Comp Group itself uh, first established uh, January 2020, and uh, uh, since our first first meeting, gone from strength to strength, and we've um, uh, our, our member membership uh, or voluntary membership uh, has increased to we have around about 40 to 45 uh, uh, active members. Um, I've highlighted in green some significant uh, uh, membership um, organisations such as the Green Construction Board, Concrete Centre, uh, and and Syria. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's fair to say uh, that the low carbon concrete group, uh, when it talks, it, it does talk with a degree of uh, of authority. Uh, the LCCG itself um, is endorsed by the CLC, uh, the Green Construction Board, ICE, and the uh, ISTROPG, as well as the uh, MPA Concrete Centre. We launched uh, or published the route map in April 2022, uh, and the focused. Uh, written in there was the focus must be on enabling a rapid scale up of successful technologies that deliver reductions in carbon emissions. But that's not uh, at the expense of safety and doing things right uh, and so forth. That, that remains paramount with any construction material, whatever we use, um, it has to be uh, right, suitable and fit for purpose. Within the route map itself, then uh, there are eight sections. Uh, ranging from uh, knowledge transfer, design specification, supply and construction, uh, through to optimizing existing technology, adopting new technology, and uh, uh, there's a discussion point on carbon sequestration, capture and use, uh, with section eight uh, being the next steps. And there's a significant number of next steps uh, in, that, in that chapter, uh, some of which we are already uh, underway with. So we have Workstream 1, which was originally the, the CDT, the Concrete Decarbonisation Task Force. Uh, however, uh, on review and reflection, uh, it was agreed that um, the LCCG was um, widely recognised and therefore it should remain uh, as the driver behind this initiative. Uh, but the LCCG um, is formed up three, three separate groups. Uh, so you've got the LCCG, the LCCG group itself. Uh, which is actively working on the route map and uh, its work streams, the LCC operations group, um, which uh, deals with the programming, communications, coordinating, uh, tracking and feeding into the ICE governance. And then the uh, LCC stakeholder group uh, for interested parties, those who can be drawn upon for work streams and comms group and, and increase the size of the LCCG. So the CDT is no longer um, a, a mainstay, it, it is back to things as we know it. We have uh, Workstream 3, which is the Flex standard, the Flex 350, which we'll discuss uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, Workstream 4, optimization and improvements uh, to BS8501. Workstream 5, which is uh, continued benchmarking. And Workstream 6, the, uh, the now famous GGBS uh, question. Workstream 3, uh, the Flex 350, uh, being published or will be published by BSI. Uh, lead technical author is uh, Dr. James Aldred, who's recently finished a similar uh, piece of work in Australia, uh, the um, guidance uh, handbook to AS3600 for AACMs and geopolymers. The Flex 350 uh, is made up of lead technical author James Aldred, an advisory group uh, of, people, of representatives of those companies on the left hand side, with constant communications uh, with key existing uh, key committees. The Flex 350, then, uh, it is a flex standard, uh, and we believe that um, the work should be completed within the next two years to produce a performance-based uh, standard rather than a traditional, um, maybe even perceived to be prescriptive uh, standard for the, for the use or, of engineers, specifiers, uh, and everybody else within the construction industry to allow the specification of cement, chemistry, concrete technology that may well sit outside the existing um, framework of uh, codes and standards. 
we're there uh, now at the moment and we're just about to uh, complete the uh, advisory group review of the drafting document. And then once that happens, uh, then we get on with the next stage. BS8 500 improvements then. So BS8 500 is due to be revised by the end of this year, which will include the um, provision for SEM6 uh, cements. Uh, the other uh, improvement for BS8 500 is the ongoing review of uh, the minimum cement contents in, in relation to uh, durability. Uh, so far as to say, if we can reduce the minimum cement contents by say 10%, and we would reduce our uh, carbon intensity per mix design um, significantly just with the stroke of a pen. So that work is uh, being undertaken by Gareth Wake, MPA uh, and others uh, uh, with uh, updates periodically uh, throughout the year. The EM 1975 cements are not currently in BS8501, uh, but we do expect them to be uh, showing appearance by the end of the year. So the question I raised to uh, insurance companies um, a couple of months ago was if a cement type is not provided in the current revisions of 8500, is it excluded from insurance cover? Uh, the answer overwhelmingly from the uh, insurance company was uh, yes. And then can a structure built with a concrete from EM1975 cement be provided with a warranty? And the answer was we would probably need to look at it. So there's a degree of um, disconnection between the insurance companies and standards and codes and what they understand to be uh, relevant and, and what isn't or may not be. Bit of work there. So benchmarking then, one of the outcomes of the LCCG uh, route map uh, was benchmarking our concretes in relation to, to the strength class. So the starting point in trying to assess the carbon intensity of any concrete is to measure the reductions in carbon relative to a reference value. So we can determine from that reference point whether we are improving or not. The, the benchmark itself uh, is designed to be dynamic. It right? will move year on year uh, as more data becomes available. Uh, the benchmarking shows what is currently available on the open market. And uh, it, it um, categorizes into bands A++ to G. At the moment, the benchmark uh, represents concrete strength grades CA10 to C5060. However, the next situation uh, increases that by another two or three strength classes. So global production of GGBS is fully utilized uh, within the, uh, the world of concrete or well, there is uh, a school of thought that there is some uh, GGBS uh, still left available to, um, to use. But essentially, it is, it is a constrained material and we're using probably as much as we possibly can. Specifying GGBS is, is the go-to solution for lowering carbon uh, within our concrete, but not necessarily the right solution for all, uh, uh, for all environments. So we have to be careful of when we're using uh, constrained resources in relation to what it is we're trying to build within our projects. To help us uh, determine uh, accurate data within the industry and carrying on from the benchmarking, we are developing the uh, carbon measuring assessment and reporting tool uh, so we can provide timely updates on concrete consumption, uh, the, the use of secondary cementitious materials, what elements are more carbon intensive. We'll be able to report against uh, regions, so what regions are doing uh, well, what regions require uh, particular focus or even uh, investment, and a significant uh, contribution towards quality checking uh, in, um, in regards to the, the concrete we're using, uh, which will be a, um, a fundamental area for insurance companies to focus on if we're going to be using lower carbon technologies. So we can record the data uh, very accurately uh, and keep everyone else informed. So that's going to be developed uh, and be released in the next two to three months. So Workstream 6, uh, which was the GGBS question, uh, it's still in its final draft stage. Uh, in the next, I think, four to six weeks, uh, the final uh, document uh, will be ready for, for release. So a number of authors have come together from, from the industry and explored the, um, the question about GGBS and should we use more? Should we start restricting uh, the use of GGBS? 
how much GGBS is available here in the UK uh, and globally. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the um, the work started off under the under the premise of the increased use of slag in the UK is only going to increase global greenhouse gas emissions. However, um, through all the work and research and discussions uh, uh, between the authors and others, uh, the conclusions are that we should continue to use uh, GGBS where it is technically um, required, but not just for lowering the carbon intensity of our concretes. And then Workstream 11. So this is a new Workstream uh, that's about to come online and will be a collaboration between the uh, insurance sector and the construction industry to help educate, uh, transfer knowledge and provide an equitable platform for the consideration of new lower carbon concretes or new cement technologies uh, in use on our projects. There is a bit of a disconnect between what the insurance sector believes uh, uh, to be um, able to be specified and have uh, warranties provided to what actually is in return to in relation to the construction industry itself. So there's a degree of um, education and collaboration uh, required. So there's a lot of risk involved or perception of risk involved for new technologies. So we need to be careful what we're doing and we need to be assured that uh, whatever it is that we're specifying, existing technologies as well as new technologies is suitable and fit for purpose. So there's pre-construction, there's during construction uh, uh, mitigation measures, which we need to ensure that uh, everyone's aware of and it's documented and recorded as well as verification. And there are some who are even calling for the old fashioned Clava works to come back into play to provide the sign off that things are good to go. So the, the draft scope and document is being written by uh, ICE uh, and should be sent out to those who uh, have, uh, are gonna be part of the working group at Syria uh, and uh, Andy Moores is, uh, is leading uh, on that for, for Syria. So meeting the net zero challenge then. Well, there's stuff that we can do today because the, the existing codes and standards do not specifically to refer to a concrete having to be made to cements conforming to EN 1971. So there's a degree of confusion uh, that exists uh, in regards to the perception uh, or, or the use of existing standards. We have new cements coming online uh, very shortly, uh, such as uh, SEM6. And as a demonstration, uh, BS8500 uh, lists 20, uh, 27 uh, cement types, but only 17 of those are, are carried forward into uh, BS8500. EM1971 is a performance standard, not a prescriptive uh, standard. Uh, and with these uh, cements, certain benefits accrue to enhance durability. Principally, the less PC we use, the better the concrete in general terms. So uh, there's a share of a typical, well, a typical share of um, uh, cement types for a contractor today, but with the introduction of SEM6 cements, we get a reallocation of, uh, of materials and we, get, and we end up with a reduction in uh, carbon intensities, potentially. So, there's no industry-wide accepted definition of what a low carbon concrete is. Now, the LCCG route map does not try to define what that is either. So a lower carbon concrete could be considered to be a concrete that is lower in carbon intensity than the business as usual mix design without compromising the mechanical or durability performance as specified by the designer. So the LCCG is um, continuing its work, continuing with the, with the um, commitment it made uh, last year, but we are still looking for uh, people to join uh, and, uh, and contribute. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. There's a, an absolute huge amount of information there. So just a reminder that this webinar is recorded and you will be able to see all of that information that Andy's run through. There's, you know, I think the progress that industry is making, Andy, I think is testament in terms of how important this is. 
So um, do please pick up on the recording um, post this webinar. So we will now be joined by Saeed El Belbo, who will be presenting from a client perspective. Over to you, Saeed. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, I'll take control of, sorry. Um, my name is Saeed El Belbo. I work for National Highways. I lead the concrete and corrosion uh, team, including low carbon. In the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I'll be going through National Highways Net Zero targets, our uh, Net Zero concrete roadmap. Within the limited time, I won't be able to cover pavement and concrete roads. Example of National Highways carbon reduction levers and key messages in summary. So, So we published our net zero highways plan in 2021, committed to realizing net zero emission from our construction and maintenance activity by 2040. This is really from the inception, uh, what we need to do, how we do it, what we do it with, and at the end thinking of design and other aspects and including demolition or recycling. We have commitment to reduce our maintenance and construction emissions by at least 90% by 2040 compared to our baseline of 2020. This is a huge target, quite an ambitious one. Our net zero carbon roadmap was developed uh, working closely with the industry and in close consultations with manufacturer and our supply chain our main focus on concrete, steel, and asphalt, clearly because this is a large part of our business. Now, quite an example of our big picture. Concrete installed emit about 88 kilogram uh, CO2 on average, is debatable. We use over 217,000 ton CO2 equivalent in 2020, and we think this figure is underestimated. So just some example of our carbon reduction levers, and these, again, I should mention, they do not include the design, uh, construction, others such as selection. Cement clinker productions, reduction in cement content, I'll cover that later. Again, SCMs, we have a good move from allowing structure to gen concrete, use of pile void formers, reduction in blinding thickness, raw material transportations, concrete transportations, 50 days trans compliance, and that's in relation to additives or cement additive, construction plan and emissions. So, at this stage, waiting for the next one to come, okay. So just going back to some selection of our carbon reduction or levers, uh, cement content is a big aspect, big potential for reductions. I hope, or oh, I'm sure we all agree. One of them is really move from structural concrete to gen grade, so we directed our immediate focus to a new wider scope for specifying uh, MCHW 2600 and cellular concrete. We allow the use of gen or RC type designated concrete and cellular application. Why ancillary application? Are we going for the easy when? Well, yes, but ancillary application form a quite a reasonable size of our concrete production. So it's by design really. Um, we won't produce our specifications until about uh, 2024. So on that basis, we produced or published CH memo for 8322. And that allow RC gen designated concrete uh, as alternative to the standard prescribed ST type concrete. So in general, basically gen mixes uses substantially less cement. 
Now, we do encourage design and specifier of non-structured civil work to follow suit and consider low carbon cement type, not only saying use cement, it'll be good if you can specify the cement which contains additives. So we are actively specific, and this talk obviously is concrete in general, is equally applicable to the precast industry, but we've been recently speaking and actively engaging the precast industry on modular constructions, general. Uh, how much difference the change of structure to gen from precast use, I'll be relying on you really and, and, and the precast, but I do appreciate that the precast industry tends to look for uh, rapid turnover and they need to get things out of the factory quickly, but that's something really is a choice for you to make in an option. Now, as a big one, I think for us, for everyone, is a reduction in clinker production emissions. Uh, hydrogen powered furnaces, we clearly don't have influence on that except indirect influence, so we can encourage and work closely when they manufacture in that respect. Increased use of limestone cement and ternary brand, as uh, Andy mentioned earlier, we the new BS8500 would incorporate the changes. Uh, we are actively on the steering committee uh, and putting to this. The other one is 56 day compressive strength is a high GGBS obviously. And uh, this, this element is, is quite an important one. Uh, we do appreciate is application specific and it's not only related to GGBS it's, it's for additive in general, but when you don't have strict requirement for 28 days compressive strength, uh, then that can be an option for you. And it's application specific. So there's something for you to consider in general again. We're looking at alternative cement in the medium term. ACM, obviously one of them, secondary fly ash, and there are others as well. So we're proactively looking at this. But this is something that we look at it in maybe as a medium term and once there's sufficient data to support these in that respect. Now the next one is low carbon for structural use. When I say structural use, it's highway structural use, but obviously applicable to others. Uh, as, as asset owner and operator, we have to be extremely careful for using low carbon concrete application. We are open-minded, we are for innovations, but we need to ensure safety. We having 45 tons running on our bridges and others, we obviously need to make safe, they are safe. And we need to ensure performance, both in terms of uh, structural but also in terms of uh, per durability as well so in in that respect it's quite an important for us to find the data unfortunately we have a lot of lesson learned and i don't mean to be critical but just really as an example best practice in 1960s was the use of salt as accelerator to set concrete fast yes salt it raises the eyebrow now but it was best practice at that time. Uh, it caused widespread steel corrosions with huge implication in billions of, co of, of cost, pounds or dollar cost in that respect. So at the moment for highway structures, we only designed concrete complying with MCHW1700 is currently permitted. 420 years, 50 years. We do realize there are other standards now, like the past 88220, and now obviously that that will be replaced by the BS flex. But on the other hand, we we, do, we need to ensure the data on that. As I said, we're proactive on the BSI committee, but at the moment, from our point of view, it's very difficult to assess non-compliant low carbon concrete. We don't have evidence of long term or we looking at data. So we are doing our part. We're working very closely with the industry. We are working very closely with organizations like yourself and others 
to do this. Uh, so we're doing our part, but we expect the industry to do more. It's not criticism, a lot of good practices there, but quite often we get man man manufacturer giving us data which is not complete and we could be easily overwhelmed in terms of the amount of data uh, we get in that respect. So basically, the last slide. As the key message, I won't go through them all because of the time, but we we now taking really good step from allowing gen concrete uh, instead of ST concrete that had measurable carbon reduction with potential increase when others, you know, this is widely used on that. For the structural side, we need to ensure safety, durability of non-compliant low carbon structure of concrete. So we don't have the data durability strength to, uh, so we have, we need to take more actions uh, in collaboration with the industry. And the last one is really, thank you for uh, your time. Thank you, Saeed. I think there's, again, it's a huge amount of information to share from a um, asset owner perspective. So we will now move on to our next speaker. Yeah, Thank you, Saeed. Um, but in the meantime, please keep your questions coming. Uh, we'll pick them up uh, in the discussion shortly. Remember to click the thumbs up uh, to like other uh, attendees' questions. It helps us to identify the most properly ones coming through. We're now going to hear from Ken Davey, who's an associate at Supply Chain Sustainability School and advisor, industry advisor at Build Off Site. And Ken will provide an update from a consultancy perspective. Over to you, Ken. Thank you, Kat. Good morning, everyone. Um, the, the basic sort of theme behind uh, what I'm going to speak about is, is where is the carbon? Um, and I think um, some, some of the content here uh, is a reflection on what, what Saeed has just said, is that it's a lack of data. Um, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is actually output from a report uh, published by the Supply Chain Sustainability School back in um, April. Um, as I say, the, the objective here was to try to, uh, to determine where the actual carbon is in uh, off-site projects. I mean, this is, um, and, and getting the data to actually uh, produce the report was actually something of a challenge. As you can see, um, by moving production from site into factory in controlled conditions, um, the, the actual carbon emissions uh, are moved into a different stage in the project. What, what's quite interesting was, um, as I say, where is the carbon? As, as you can see from this graph, uh, the codes here are actually taken from the RICS uh, life cycle, cycle uh, publication. What's interesting though, is that operational energy use at 67% is, is, is by far and away the biggest producer of carbon emissions. If we, if, if all of the operational use then moves into renewables, that, that particular graph will change significantly and we'll see a far, far greater emphasis on the, uh, the earlier stages, the product stage, the transport and the construction. I mean, it, it, transport at 2% uh, seems to be quite small, but I think that will become far more significant um, as, we, as we move from obviously uh, fossil fuels across the renewable energy sources. This particular um, graph is based, as you can see, on a, a residential scheme. Um, and the challenge, again, is getting data for uh, different types of construction, different methodology. Um, I don't think we, we found anything by way of, of concrete structures, the precast concrete. Although I believe, and, and Oliver perhaps can confirm us later, that um, here has, has been commissioned to do um, a survey of, um, I think it might be the operational energy use in a prison, a uh, fairly new prison, which was actually precast concrete structure. So what we what we see here, obviously, is the, the Green Building Council's uh, uh, proposals for actually reducing uh, carbon. I think a um, couple of things that, that I've picked out from this is the building clever. I'm, I'm seeing um, articles now about the use of things like nano silica in concrete maybe andy can comment on this is this later and also graphene uh, in the concrete mixes that, that i think that there's an experiment ongoing in the netherlands at the moment although there is research going back five or six years in terms of the use of graphene um, 
and I think uh, as a fibre and, and means of actually re uh, reducing the actual cement content. I think the, the figures I read that um, were something like um, 2.4 uh, times stronger uh, and, and, and considerably uh, less cement, less, less obviously in, in the mix. And in building efficiency, that's all about, I think, um, pre-cast pre construction. There's clear evidence, obviously, that uh, by moving from site across the factory, um, and this, the supply chain school has a few case studies on that. Um, I've not included any here, as this this is an overview of the actual um, guidance itself. Um, but if, if anyone's interested and would like to register with the school, you can find you'll get access to some of these case studies. I've got one from I think PCE for a laboratory in Cambridge where uh, there was a move from uh, in situ to precast um, with something of the order of 80 to 85 percent of the structure being precast, whilst the uh, the basement and the core of the building was being cast in situ to to reduce the actual duration of the project. So what we've got in the report is suggestions for nine ways, as you can see, to reduce the carbon. Um, it's a case of looking back at the graph and seeing that perhaps transport um, is not a huge influence at the moment. But as I say, if if the actual operational carbon uh, moves across, or is significantly reduced rather, uh, with the introduction of uh, renewable energy sources, and all of these factors become far more important in the overall process. Things to avoid, obviously, is, is just reducing reducing material, um, reducing and uh, decarbonizing factories is, is quite an, a, an interesting approach. I think um, Bullivant and are a case in point where they have um, invested in renewable energies for their their, their production facility. Um, and they're switching to things like uh, electrically powered forklift trucks to, to help decarbonize the factory. And there are numerous other techniques used around the country in terms of decarbonizing production. Um, places like, and not, not again, not concrete, but uh, I think um, Kingspan um, have a zero carbon fa uh, approach for some of their factories such that zero waste and zero carbon if they, if they can actually achieve it. We obviously established in the in the process of the study that was done before the guidance was published that um, there's potential to reduce waste quite significantly by going off site, and uh, and obviously less embodied carbon. The forty percent figure here is actually based on an analysis by Cambridge University for a volumetric modular project in Croydon, uh, ten degrees, which is forty plus stories high. Um, interestingly, they, it's a steel structure, but the floor uh, in the modules is concrete. Um, but uh, the analysis indicated that even with with quite a significant element of concrete, plus also the the, um, the core structures for stability, um, the overall uh, figures were 40% less than compared with similar, um, shall we say, traditionally built structures. The report was actually, and the guidance was actually prepared through consultation with the supply chain school members and partners. There's something of the order of about 200 partners at the moment. Um, and through some uh, workshop uh, activity, um, obviously the perceived challenge, uh, challenges were, were assessed and everybody was asked to provide their, their data and their, their input to these. But, uh, I think, again, we're seeing some suggestions here as to how to actually uh, reduce the overall footprint. Um, to paraphrase a well-known um, supermarket, I think it's every little bit can actually help. Main construction stage opportunities uh, shown here. At, uh, the 30% against reduced, reduced transport um, is 30% of 2%. But again, I would say that that 30% as we change from fossil fuels to renewables will become a, a far more significant. Perceived challenge actually if, from a construction point of view again. Um, this gathered from gathered from the, the school partners and incorporated into the report. 
So again, just to reiterate, the, the challenge here was to identify where the carbon is in offsite and where we must actually influence. Operational carbon, um, I'm just going to pass over this at the moment because I think operational carbon to a certain extent is, is the switch over from um, fossil fuels to renewable sources. Um, there are several recommendations. Um, obviously, client and procurement teams can have a big influence. Design teams need to understand where the carbon is. Um, manufacturers and designers need to work together uh, to try and minimise the carbon, whether it in any particular type of construction, whether it's concrete precast or, or any of the other materials. And obviously, then the, the, the contractors, now as Saeed said and, and, and Andy has said previously, monitoring and collecting activity data is, is critical critical and I think at the moment we lack it we lack that data so these are the enables enablers for actually reducing carbon overall and then finally if you would like a copy of the actual guidance um, if you go to the supply chain school website um, you you will if you're not already registered you will have to register and you will um, be able to uh, download a copy of that guys' report. And that's it from me this morning. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ken. I think, again, lots of useful information there. And I think just linking it back to a point that Dirk mentioned at the beginning in terms of past 2018 and the 2023 version, which covers buildings and infrastructure now, I think a lot of the things in terms of having um, the wider supply chain play their role, I think you've picked up the, on those nicely, Ken. So we are now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Andy Kane. He was the head of construction engineering at QBE Euro European Operations, who's going to give us some insights from an insurance perspective and hopefully some response to some of the challenges that Andy Mulhern has already raised. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks, Kat. Um, excuse my uh, croaky voice, um, but we'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. Um, I'm Andy Kane, um, as well as um, being head of uh, construction engineering for QBE. Um, I also sit on the executive committee of the um, International Association of Engineering Insurers and the London Engineering Group of Insurers. Um, and I thought I'd start just by talking about um, the claims uh, that we see, because this is um, really what... Um, drives the insurance industry response to um, changes in technology. Um, and if you have a look at the statistics that are produced by the uh, International Association of Engineering Insurers, you can see that the, 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 the loss experience that we see from construction projects um, are really categorized into three large categories, uh, which are fire, flood and water damage, uh, and collapse. And those collapses um, are of all types of structures and equipment, um, but are predominantly driven by construction defect. Um, and when I look at my uh, claim statistics on a, on a monthly basis, then construction defect is, is one of the highest uh, causes of loss um, that we see on our, on our um, portfolio. And, and these, um, Defects have severe consequences. Um, you know, we get damage to projects, disruption to the program and delay. Um, we can do see fatalities and, and injuries, um, costs, fines, legal action, uh, loss of reputation and business, and the opportunity cost of your engineers and senior management in putting things right. Um, you know, so this is this is really where we see the impact of of some of the issues that we we might see when we're talking about changes in construction technology and modern modern methods of construction, um, and and we have seen uh, as an industry a, a number of offsite risk issues, um, and underwriters are concerned about some of the losses that we're seeing and they're, they're significant losses. Um, in October 2021, the London Engineering Group. Uh, at our annual conference, um, had a presentation on modular construction. Um, and in a poll of the underwriters, um, most felt the modular presented a higher risk to insurers than traditional building methods. 
and that's uh, an interesting point of view, but probably driven by some of the large losses that we've seen. Um, also in 2021, the International Association of Engineering Insurers issued a working group paper on modular construction following some of these, these large losses. So modular um, and modern methods of construction is definitely a topic um, that is on insurers' um, radar and um, is driving some of the engagement that um, some of the bodies uh, in the insurance industry and companies are, are having. So I just wanted to move on to, to talk about precast in, in particular, some of the positive and negative risk aspects. Um, I, I won't cover here some of the, the, the aspects really relating to uh, the positive aspects of modular in general that we know about in terms of uh, program, um, safety, um, you know, fewer operatives working at height, things like that, that we we, we kind of take for granted now that, that these are, are positive aspects uh, that we like to see. Um, but if we talk about precast concrete in, in particular, um, if we look at, um, you know, the factory conditions for, for producing concrete elements, um, you know, the setting of molds, uh, reinforcement um, and curing conditions, those all being done in a factory and controlled environment are preferable to the, the variables that we might see on site with temperature, moisture, et cetera. Um, the quality control and testing regimes can be managed a bit more easily, um, but they need, do need consideration. Um, and that's something that, that uh, I think really um, site management need to think about is, is when they're looking at non-standard uh, products is how do they, manage that those control and testing regimes with the supply chain um you know i've been to a couple of uh, our clients uh, sites where they do these and and they have robotic processes that can really prevent workmanship issues when you're looking at um you know setting of reinforcing spacing things like that um and the 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 on-site the the in the the precast can prevent some of the on-site issues with pores um, that we see such as lack of vibration that causes voids um, and delays causing cold joints, which are, are quite common defects that we see um, in in situ concrete. Um, and then because we are um, insurance and we deal with the uh, the consequences of, of issues, um, some of the ne negative aspects that we see um, and systemic defect risk is, is probably the, the most considerable and is the one that we see across modular as a whole, not just um, in concrete. Um, the supply chain risk can be enhanced. Um, you know, um, things it's it's harder to deal with potentially um, a problem with the supply chain off-site than on-site in some cases, um, whether it could be a territory that you're using um, or a company that goes into liquidation. One of the challenges for insurers is really the cost to repair or replace something in situ, which can be significantly higher than the original cost um, that we've priced the risk on, um, because we price the risk on the actual concrete, uh, the, the contract value, um, which wouldn't necessarily uh, be what we pay in the event of something going wrong on site. Um, enhanced transit risks, you know, we've already heard from Ken about transit um, becoming a, a significant part of the the carbon um, uh, equation. Um, but if we're moving uh, more completed um, elements than, than we were before, we need to give some consideration to those transit and lifting risks. Um, and design changes can be more difficult to implement uh, during the, the lifetime of a project um, where offsite has been chosen as, as the way to, to move forward. And, and really coming back to that um, quality control and testing regimes, the oversight of the site engineering team is not, not as easy because some important work is being done away um, from the project site. Um, I just wanted to, to give you a, a case study from uh, uh, not, not in the UK, um, uh, but but I think quite relevant to today's audience. Uh, this was a £800 million plus highway project that had two tunnels. 
um, cut and cover uh, method of construction um, using 900 plus precast concrete beams. And the supplier of these beams, um, which wasn't native to the country that they were, uh, the project was in, builds a plant close to the project to construct the beams. Um, because it got to um, court, um, the some of these uh, details are, are, are widely known, but there were issues with the beams that were discovered post installation of a significant number of them. And those included non-approved welding techniques of the reinforcing cage, lack of concrete cover, twisted and incorrectly placed wire strands, and some edge cracking on, on a significant number of beams. So the original decision by the awarding authority was that all of these beams needs to be removed and replaced uh, following some destructive testing that went on. And originally, I think the insurance claim was well over 100 million pounds that, that was being sought um, in, a, in a settlement. Um, there was a compromise reached with some removal, some in situ repair, um, and some strengthening, but the project was still delayed by 18 months. So a significant um, issue um, caused by this um, systemic defect issue in the, in the construction process, the manufacturing process. <clears throat> so um, what, how do we, uh, at a high level, think about how do we need to, to manage that supply chain risk? Um, well, the main contractor needs to engage in the quality control process through the supply chain. Um, supervisory resource at factory sites for non-standard products is something that we're seeing more and more. And interesting that somebody mentioned the Clark of Works role, which we are seeing uh, more often. And that may be uh, a role that needs to have, you know, significant time off the project site at the suppliers. Ensuring suppliers from other countries are familiar with local codes, and, and we're talking about development of codes as well, um, which is a challenge for the insurance industry. Um, and testing, including destructive testing before installation, is really important. Um, and then something that uh, is, is clearly um, not, it should be in every project risk um, uh, register is that contingency planning for supply chain failures or um, on-site repair or rectification being needed of um, these elements or changes in design. So I think that is it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. So I'd like to now move on to our next speaker, who is Oliver Brooks, who's a project manager at Kia Group. And Oliver will be providing um, an overview from a con contractor's perspective and specifically the tagging work that's done uh, with Her Majesty's Prison, Milsic. Over to you, Oliver. Thanks, Kat. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so this, this will be a little bit different from some of the other sessions. So there's, there's a lot of ideas that are going to come at you here. Um, so as, as Kat introduced me, I'm Oliver Brooks. Um, Project manager for Kia, uh, mainly working on HMP Mill site in Yorkshire. Um, my role is to manage the offsite manufactured packages associated with the uh, structural precast components. Um, my career generally has revolved around the themes of offsite manufacture, um, digital, and concrete. So this is what leads me to, to this type of role, working on delivering what is probably the most advanced platform design. Um, currently in use in this country. Um, for my part in this webinar, I'm going to talk about a new piece of technology that we've uh, implemented to track precast components and look at what benefits we may be able to derive from that in terms of carbon savings. Um, some of you will have been to the Construction Excellence and Build Off site um site visit to mill psych last month um just briefly for those of you who haven't um mill psych is a 459 million pound category c resettlement prison which we're building for the ministry of justice um for the prison enthusiast amongst you this follows hmp five wells at wellingborough and hmp foss way in leicester which are very similar designs um, it is a project with an ambitious program 
We've been on site for just over a year now. Um, practical completion is planned for quarter three of next year. Um, because I'm talking mainly about precast, and there's some sort of mainly precast focused numbers on the slide here. The term structural assembly includes some things other than precast, um, for example, structural steel, um, holocore planks, and delta beams. And the tracked items that I refer to uh, at the bottom there is what I'm going to speak about mainly. Um, I'll tell you what technology we've been using, um, why we're using it, uh, what its impacts are, and its potential for future development of the concepts. Okay, so what are we using? Um, component tracking really is essentially monitoring the journey of a precast panel or, or any um, item really from design through manufacture to delivery to site and handover. Um, a lot of that is performed through use of existing data and mining and extracting information from that. For example, when a drawing is approved on our electronic document management system, that particular unit will reach that key stage in its production. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those key stages in a second. The stages that are concerned with the unit being completed, um, and probably the most important, i.e. when it's ready for payment um, at certain stages, um, are leaving the precast yard, arriving on site and being installed. And they are monitored with tracking hardware that you can see on this slide. Um, so the system that we've got comprises uh, what we know as tags and gateways. Uh, the tags uh, that you can see by the mobile device on the, on the slide and like I have here, hopefully that shows, yeah, there we are, um, are battery powered and work on Bluetooth technology. They emit a signal continuously uh, that the gateways, so the box light things um, where I've got a captioned unit leaves yard and unit arrives on site, those, those boxes pick up that, that signal. Um, and the gateways are placed at entry and exit locations to the manufacturer's yards and the site itself to basically inform when the precast unit has, has reached those locations. Um, we've procured this system from an Australian company called Wynomia. Uh, PCE had worked with them before using the technology and they're working for us um, at Millsyke. Um, so there's some familiarity in our supply chain there. And MACE uh, had also used the system in the UK um, it's also deployed in Singapore and other countries across the world as well um, on other projects. Um, Wynomia's strength really is, is in monitoring supply chains, um, and, that, and that's what we're employing it for. So I touched on the different stages um, that we looked to monitor uh, just a second ago, and this is the stages that we looked to monitor in full. Um, the table on the right shows each stage. And then next to it, the source of the data, which informs us that a particular stage has been reached. A really important point to make here is that the tags and hardware um, only make up the yellow squares. There's only four of them on there. The majority of the tracking exercise is actually done through use of existing data on our project systems. For example, the electronic document management system or quality management system you see as day looks there. Um, just completeness, there is another picture there illustrating the size of a tag, so they're not very big. Um, having said that, that, that cup is, is quite large, um, so maybe not the best illustrator of scale, but there we are. Um, okay, so why, why are we tracking units? Why, what's the point in it? Um, the reasons for us investing in this technology are many, and there are a few listed here. Um, I'll talk about carbon footprint directly in a second, but there is an implied carbon footprint reduction in some of the other points here. So, for example, greater certainty allows us to build in less redundancy um, in terms of logistics and program particularly, um, and therefore be more efficient on site. Supporting the digital transformation strategy also gives rise to reduction of carbon footprint in the long term because more automation is possible through greater collection of more accurate data. Um, automated decisions could then be made on when loads are sent to site or, um, or when loads are sent based on uh, site or weather conditions. Uh, this is commonplace in other industries. For example, um, if this weekend's weather forecast is sunny, your local supermarket will be getting a greater stock of sausages and charcoal via automatic forecasting of demand with minimal human input required. Um, in the same way in construction, we could make better 
and perhaps even automated decisions with technology based on data that we collect on our projects. And um, this is where we could begin to see um, uh, AI uh, type concepts um, creep into our practices. Referring to the Technicolor prison house block, you see on the right-hand side of this slide, um, the, the tracking system, the binomial system gives us a real-time-ish view of uh, progress on our structures. Um, and we're also using it for m and &E now, so things like prefabricated riser modules, roof modules, plant skids. Um, and we can see by the color of each unit there on that visualization, its individual status at any point in time. So for example, um, items in green are installed on site, those in pink are in transportation, those in blue have been cast. Um, and this live view really assists us um, with uh, design and also operational management. Um, one of the key drivers for adoption of the system was the large supply chain for the new prison, which in part was mandated by limited supply in the precast market. Uh, having a view of progress in one format across all suppliers helped us to manage the project efficiently with less staff than we had at the same point at uh, Five Worlds Prison at Wellingborough, which was also delivered by Keir. So moving the focus a bit closer to carbon, um, there are principally four areas in which we can decarbonize the precast package. And that is in design, manufacture, transport, and installation. And these tie into some of the themes that Ken mentioned earlier. And everything we can do across these areas, um, of course, will help. At the moment, most of the potential we've discussed is around transportation carbon, uh, making loads more efficient, sending them at the right time, um, however, there are opportunities in other areas that arise from better control of the units and the project. Just jumping back to transportation briefly, um, this is all of the precast manufacturing locations for Mill Psych. Um, because those units are coming from locations distributed across the UK and Ireland, knowledge of the physical location of the units and status allows a better understanding of whether we will meet site dates. Um, it's an early look ahead and it also allows us to avoid inefficient allocation of management, labour or materials on site, which in themselves um, give way to, to carbon savings. Um, thinking about future potential and tying into some of the themes that we've, we've seen and build off site in recent times, um, Having a comprehensive tracking system may also allow us to further remove some of the challenges associated with this type of supply chain distribution, depending on product types and locations, and possibly not only thinking about precast here, there may be opportunities for consolidation of loads, for example, and thereby removing vehicles from the roads. Similarly, use of consolidation sites for individual projects um, or as part of contractor alliances um, could be facilitated on some schemes as well. Um, so perhaps some food for thought for our logistics models. Moving on to manufacture, I want to talk about some of the less obvious advantages of tracking precast units and areas where we push the capability of the technology. Um, on some units for Milpsych, we have ancillary processes that have taken place on the units which are performed at precast factories by subcontractors other than the precast manufacturer. Um, examples of this include um, balustrade fitment to stair units, um, installation of mastic around windows and underfloor heating mat testing. Um, use of component tracking uh, has enabled us to do this work offsite accurately and understand the number of units available for these ancillary processes to take place. Um, so what this has done is it's, it's really enabled those offsite processes, it's enabled us to do more things offsite and cut down the, uh, the travel and the carbon emissions expended by doing work on site. Um, another area, potential area of impact and one that we've made use of on Millsike is the uh, reduction in QA regimes. So greater confidence in recording statuses of uh, units gives us greater confidence. And we've, we've probably saved between 100 and 200 tonnes of um, CO2 equivalents on Millsike alone just because of that. Um, very briefly, Future opportunities, um, and this is uh, bringing it firmly back to concrete. Um, if we increase the capability of tags, and there are items on the market that are close to doing this at the moment, 
there is a possibility that we could remotely monitor the strength gain of precast panels uh, using embodied um, thermocouples. Um, most of you on this call will know that one of the biggest carbon challenges for the precast industry is that concrete mixed design strengths, um, in order to be able to demold early, require um, high compressive strength mixes um, and therefore high cement content. Um, if we had a more accurate and instantaneous picture of strength gain, it might be that we could look at reducing the specified strengths, which could then lead to a further reduction in the embodied carbon. Uh, this is not something that we're currently doing um, or is something that's been done on a, a large scale elsewhere, but this technique has been used in the past on uh, in situ works, particularly in infrastructure, um, and could be one for the future, really, for um, remote sensing and, uh, and data collection. So um, without further ado, that includes my section on component tracking. Um, thank you for listening to that. I'll take any questions after the conclusion of the next piece, which is from uh, Peter Deegan of Banahers. Um, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Oliver. I think uh, some great insight in terms of the benefits of technology and how this can improve transparency of data and evidence as it goes through in terms of delivery. So thank you for that. Uh, as you say, we will now be moving on to uh, Peter Deegan, who's a director at Banagir Precast Concrete, and also Kieran Ennis, who's, Ennis, who's also the sustainability manager. So they will be providing insights from a manufacturer and supplier's perspective. Over to you, Peter and Kieran. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I see. Great, okay, cool. Uh, the reason why I ask is because um, I've been traveling over the place. I'm actually, Kieran is back in Ireland. So if I drop out, he'll drop in and, and uh, uh, that's what we'll do. So um, very quickly, um, because I have too many slides, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about our sustainability journey as a precaster. And um, so we're, pre well, well, we're an Irish company. Um, our head office is in, based in the center of Ireland, and the, that's just an overview there uh, in that slide. Um, but uh, we also operate out of the UK. So as I said, these first few slides are just a quick overview. You can have a quick look. It's a pretty large company. Uh, we've about 50 acres in Ireland. We've over 70 cranes. Uh, we can produce about 1,500 cubic meters of concrete a week. We're doing about 200 in the UK. Um, so it's quite a lot. Now, the reason why we came to the UK is, is like it's part of our carbon journey insofar as that we wanted to get closer to our customer. Um, the, in some respects, concrete gets a bad name from a carbon point of view, but I would always say that, you know, it's not the big offender, really. It's the fact that we use so much and we move it so far. And uh, coming to the UK was a conscious decision to get closer and reduce our transport movements. In the, the theme of this program this morning, I suppose, is talking a little bit about precast, and this is just a little overview. Um, so precast, we would say, if you go down that road, there's up to a 30% saving. Um, there's on the program, 60% in manpower. Uh, we use the latest technology. Uh, we've got uh, quality control standards pretty tight on site. We're monitoring, we've got experience, we've got strong teams. Generally, we try to get it right first time. Um, these are the benefits really at looking at uh, a precast option. I do think myself that, you know, when, and it was mentioned in an earlier uh, presentation there where people were making uh, units on site um, rather than at a precast factory and that they had issues with uh, steel and cover and all the rest. That always worries me because the big advantage of, of going to a, 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 an established precaster is that you've got experience and uh, it's, 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 it's impossible to put a value on experience. But from the point of view of uh, producing a carbon conscious concrete, um, we would look at several different things. And, and the reason why I've stuck in this slide is because at the moment um, we're doing like kind of two large jobs. One is the Silvertown Tunnel in London and one is the Everton Stadium. And there's always the low hanging fruit. And in particular with something like the Everton Stadium, which is 
fluid at the moment. Uh, we've a 33% saving uh, in the cement with the uh, reduction with the use of GGBS. And we also looked at the actual design, so smart design uh, by uh, coming in with efficient terracing, reduced uh, concrete dimensions and such like. But anyway, from an overview point of view, um, uh, we predominantly use self-compacting concrete, which is removing the kind of energy-hungry aspect of uh, concrete production. Uh, we've delved deep into super plasticizers and water reducers to help reduce cement contents and increase workability and durability. Uh, within our plant, we have a closed loop system with our water, where we're actually using our own water, whether it's in capture from, from roofs, but also from boreholes, and we keep re reusing it within the system. Timber formwork where possible and not using too much steel uh, within the forms. And the steel that we do use in the forms is generally coming from a source that is using a high recycled content. Where we're operating from is a special area of conservation. Um, and within that scope, then that keeps that's the forefront in our minds daily in that uh, we're very much conscious of our, our neighborhood, our biodiversity, um, and uh, the, we kind of try to enhance what we have and grow it. Um, I get heavily involved in European research programs just to do with sustainability and concrete performance. And because of that, we have an in-house R&D department. We actually have a, a UCAS uh, accredited lab on site where we do a, a lab on site where we do a wide range of testing, which kind of is good for the business, but also uh, is good for the future and R&D of what we're doing. We um, are trying to reduce our impacts. We have a 2025, a 2030, and a 2050 carbon reduction plan. Uh, we've targets and aims, and so far we, we're reaching them. I think when you start out on this journey, uh, you can pick up uh, the lower hanging fruit first, which is easier, and then it becomes more difficult. And I think uh, really, as I said, uh, we, we're producing about a third of our power through solar at the moment. We're increasing that to a half in the next two years. And by 2030, we should be able to be self-sufficient from a power point of view. Water, raw material is locally sourced. And then just looking at the cement, that will come through science, I believe. And that's the work that we're doing at the moment. So that's, again, just a little overview of uh, the factory. And you can see the solar panels there. And I, this is, I suppose, a slide which is important to us and important to me when we talk about sustainability. Uh, we call it our 5C approach. And the 5C approach starts with the first C, which is community. And we're heavily invested uh, into the community and our community are the people who work with us, the people that work around us and the people that we can support within that scope. The, it's a holistic approach. Um, we like to... Uh, train, develop and support our, our people. Uh, and in doing so, then that uh, has a kind of an invaluable benefit. Um, our our uh, staff are locally, uh, local, travel local. Um, and uh, once they're working in a good environment, then that assists our journey. The next C is carbon, which is what we're talking about. So it's about reducing carbon. And how do we reduce our carbon? There are several different ways, which we'll talk about later, um, but that's the journey we're on. But we would say we have to also focus on less concrete and less construction. And if we've got less concrete and less construction through smart design, then we will use less cement. And if we use less cement, we'll have less clinker, and then we'll go back to less carbon. So it's always to the forefront in our heads, is the 5C approach. If I had more time, then we get further into it. But from, from, from today, what we want to talk about, um, the design. We're challenging our design all the time. Uh, there's the term change management. It's constantly happening within our organization. How can we design more efficiently? Can we produce concrete products that can do the same, but with less concrete? Uh, we're continually increasing our replacements of the SEM1, which again is a carbon hungry, with SEM2s and SEM3s. It's not the full answer or the full picture because there's not an indefinite supply of GGBS or PFAs out there. So we have to look at other things. We use local suppliers. We have our local energy. We're looking at, because 
in everything we do with concrete, um, the process generates heat, the heat of hydration. So we've, we've done a lot of work with maturity concept, measuring and storing heat uh, and using that heat to accelerate the product rather than using cement. Um, we have introduced carbon calculations on all our mixes and we're constantly challenging those through our carbon calculation tool. What have we achieved so far? Uh, we've achieved lots of things. Um, in uh, 2007, which was this early on in our journey, we started to look at the actual bridge beams that we produced and we developed new, more efficient beams ourselves. The one that I'm showing here is just an MY beam, which would replace what was known once upon a time as an inverted T beam. Um, and again, I've listed out there, it it's a, it's provides a, a deck during installation, it's shorter spans, it allows for efficient economic bridge designs, and it's got a lower carbon footprint. So this is one of the first green beams that we've introduced. We don't broadcast it too much, but that's what we call it. But in reality, sustainability is going to come through science. And that's where R&D comes into play. And um, the, the program that I've just finished working on is a, a research project called Resilience, uh, and that's the development of ultra high durability concrete. And the, this has been kind of a, a stepping stone. Uh, a previous project was called Aerocrete. Again, you can find these offline um, and uh, to bring yourself up to speed. But the, the first project, Aerocrete, was looking at reducing or eliminating the requirement for steel reinforcing. Uh, which led us into kind of the resilience project, which is looking at concrete that will last longer and self heal. So I believe myself, there will always be a role of cement in, in concrete production, but we have to look at the thing slightly differently. So instead of somebody saying a 50 year design life or 100 year design life or 120 year design life, I was saying we have to look at a 200 year design life. If we can look at something that's 200 year design life, then obviously there are huge savings there. A project that we're working on right now is uh, with, with graphene and the, the inclusion of graphene in our mixes to help reduce the amount of cement needed. Uh, so far, the results are promising. Uh, so we're continuing on that. But again, it, that will need upscaling. Two steps back, Aerocrete. So it was a European uh, funded project to develop in, uh, kind of a low energy durable concrete. And so we looked at the inclusion of, of waste materials in the concrete, GGBS and other recycled powders. Uh, and then we replaced uh, the actual reinforcing with a BFRP bar. Uh, we decided that we tried to produce a pre-stressed flooring product, which we did. So uh, we, we pre-stressed the basalt fiber bar, produced a slab, which had never done before. We tested it to destruction which you can see there in the picture, uh, it looks a little bit like a banana. Um, so massive deflection, but with recovery to demonstrate and to prove that it could be done. In real time, then we replace steel on a job in Northern Ireland. Uh, so we use basalt fiber uh, on uh, a particular bridge on the deck. Again, I'm conscious of the time, you can follow up on that. But the resilience project, I think is a really good project because it's looking at technology and it's looking at design life. Um, right now, we've got several living labs, which is actually monitoring the behavior and the durability of this uh, concrete. And uh, that's one particular living lab we have on the west coast of Ireland, um, which uh, is giving us real time information about the corrosion there. This is our lab where we're looking at chloride migration and other testing, UCAS accredited. Um, and with this, the testing and with our sensor technology, we're just monitoring on an ongoing basis. Looking at the chloride migration, um, we're able to predict what's gonna happen uh, with the concrete. We're looking at water cement ratios, we're looking at additions. And uh, with just this slide here, it's, 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 it's a fairly straightforward test, but it's complicated in ways. Um, it's a little bit like looking at a carbonation uh, scenario where you would take your sample you would strip it, you would split it, and you'd use a thing called phenolphthalein, and you can then demonstrate the depths of penetration. The chloride migration is something similar. This is a group of us uh, that was on the last project. It's a pan-European project, um, and by working across Europe, then uh, you get great ideas, and you're able to work with the best people in the industry. So that's it. Um, Thank you, Peter.
Sorry, Kat, I, I could have worry. stayed on all day. Sorry. <laughs> a wealth of information. And I think it gives a real insight in terms of um, your organisation and actually from a supply, uh, supply and manufacturing perspective. So thank you very much for that. I would like to invite all of our um, panel members to put their cameras on ready for our Q&A session. So we have Andy Mulholland, we have Andy Kane, we have Saeed El Bulbul, we have Ken Davey, Oliver Brooks, Peter Deegan. Um, hopefully I haven't missed anybody, um, but we also have Andy Powell from the Environment Agency, um, who's also going to be joining our panel. So Andy um, leads the uh, innovation team within the Environment Agency supporting their capital programme and asset management activities. So what we've heard is a huge amount of information in terms of what we have across our wider value chain. And I think that is really quite reassuring in terms of where the industry is going. I think what we need to do is look at it from a practicality perspective. And what we've had today is from Ken, some of the challenges in terms of um, the perceived uh, blockers from a supply chain uh, sustainability school feedback we've had from Oliver in terms of the practicalities of actually looking at digitization looking at tracking and tagging our materials as we're going through use and, and through the supply chain and and from Peter we've had that insight in terms of actually what happens from a realistic perspective from a uh, from a, uh, a manufacturing um, perspective but Saeed you very much mentioned in in your overview around the challenges of data and evidence and not receiving some of that information. Now, what we've actually heard is things are happening, but what are you seeing from a client perspective in terms of what has to improve for us to move forward collectively? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked it. Uh, 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 from, from our point of view, we're actively working with the industry uh, a lot of people on the call, obviously, we're talking to them. At the moment, we are mindful. We've got 21, 23,000 structures, and we have a huge project on that. At the moment, the rule of performance they of testing and the material, the low carbon, new ones, they are really covered uh, or they're not covered by official industry accepted standards. You know, and that's that's big. There are some documents which are really good, and they they cover at the moment up to fifty years. We design for one hundred and twenty years. Uh, our our biggest uh, uh, possibly uh, challenge, I would say, is that we are approached by manufacturer. We are doing roadshow ourselves, promoting our low carbon uh, concrete map, a general talking to manufacturer. Our experience, that's not criticism and doesn't apply to everybody, but it's a challenge that we speak to various people that are doing their own testing, but done in isolations. So they're not, they're not talking to other people. So when we say we've done this trial elsewhere, either in the UK or in Europe or internationally, it's not a comprehensive testing. It's not related specifically to particular code. How does it apply to you know, the British standard, to European standard? There's a lot of gaps there. And then the other challenge we have that we tend to be overwhelmed with information. We send 500 page in between. We have to extract the chloride data and the carbonation data and long-term performance. So this is this is a big challenge for us. And until, until that is sorted really, and I think something like, I'm not promoting this, I've got to be careful, something like the BS Flex where you have performance pipe specifications where the material if you have a new material or low carbon material basically you need to go and test it according to standard get all the property both the, the structure and the durability property sorted provided and we we taking a bit more pragmatic approach i'm less interested at the moment it is very important for chloride diffusion which is like you know, chloride diffusion coefficient in the value I'm interested is provide me with a concrete is as good in terms of performance as the concrete and the standard. Okay. So this is this is this is the challenge we have at the moment. And until that's happening, unfortunately, we we can. Well, on the other hand, as I said, mentioned, we moved significantly in the gen concrete. 
for the ancillary, which is present a large part of us. So we're making good progress. But I think in that respect, the lack of data or lack of organized data. The other challenge, and I'll, I'll, if I just I'll, pause you I'll, there for a moment, because I want to bring in uh, Andy Powell from a, um, the Environment Agency client perspective. Are you experiencing similar challenges and how have you addressed data from a, your perspective? I can't, yeah. Um, I guess it's similar. Um, I, I guess our approach um, is sort of risk-based. So we've been, uh, as, as with other clients, sort of um, running pilots and trials. Um, and uh, some of those initially sort of off offline, sort of off-site trials initially, then we'll take the the, um, the the learning from that. Obviously, there's a lot of information that's available from from other pilots trials, the um, the manufacturers themselves, etc. Then then we sort of incrementally will will build on that. So we'll we'll do you know, a, a relatively low risk application and and then build on that. So we're sort of finding over the last couple of years that we've we've moved from sort of slabs. And, and wall stems as, as completely off, you know, offline in depot trials through to actually um, this year, the, the first sort of section of flood wall built, the first sort of um, access track built with um, with sort of um, the cement, the cements that are currently outside of BS8500. So we're sort of, I guess, incrementally managing that but it is it isn't easy there's lots of barriers and blockers along the way but um the i think the the low carbon concrete route map um that, that andy and the group has sort of set out a, a number of ways that we've heard all throughout the, the speakers today that that we can all sort of do we can do things now there are some some things that are harder than others um, so we would be just trying to sort of track our way through through the, uh, those opportunities as we go and, and just picking up on some of the areas in terms of having that transparency of how a product is created, whether it's built off site, um, precast, whether it's in situ, where that um, material is coming from, the activities around it. And, and Oliver, I, I think there's, there's a lot of learning that's coming out of the work in terms of the prisons and how this can be done a lot more efficiently and transparently. And are there things that you can see which can be easily um, scaled up across the sectors? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, just speaking uh, in relation to what my sort of presentation material was about, Kat, I mean, it, you could track anything, um, you know, to give you information on location, whereabouts, logistics, uh, you know, you can derive benefits from, from tracking most things in the supply chain to the point where we're thinking about um, construction supply chain systems, almost like uh, fast moving consumer goods, for example. You know, we've got a, a much clearer view of everything um, and the scalability there is, is endless. Um, I think other things that, that would really help in the sector and uh, particularly through what we do in the prisons, this is a good example, is aggregation of demand. So we're very fortunate in the fact that we are coming off the back of sort of three onto four successive prisons now that have been almost exactly the same design and having that platform design um, and the continuity and the, that sort of platform design um, allows us to, to tweak and optimise on a large scale much more easily than if we're starting with a blank sheet of paper every time. Um, and I think, uh, to their credit, I think the MOJ as a client have, have really um, facilitated that. Um, and I think other, other sort of um, large, particularly public sector clients aggregating that demand could, could certainly follow that lead. So that, that is an area of impact that I, I think we could uh, uh, really benefit from at scale in, in, other, in other sectors. Thanks, Oliver. Um, and Peter, I just want to bring you in here because obviously part of your um, own organisation sustainability journey is actually to move closer to um, the client, the end client in terms of actually that site. And how are you finding in terms of being able to provide more transparency about what you're providing, how that facilitates carbon reduction in terms of precast um, uh, materials and products? And 
do you see some of the perceived barriers that Ken was talking about really being sort of removed by actually taking a whole organization approach? Okay, Kat, I, I'm actually going to turn that question on its head, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, insofar as that, right, the, we're on a carbon journey, okay? And so to do that, we have to stand well back from our business and look at every facet within the business and break those down individually and end up with a thing called an EPD. And I don't think people mentioned EPDs, but that, that's, where we, that's where we're at, is that EPD. And all we can do is change the things that are within our control. And, and by that, I mean that, you know, the materials, our processes and our people we cannot really control so much where our customer is. And that was the point I made that we have to try and reduce that distance and get closer to them. And that's, that's about the only thing. But the other side of it is where, where we would find problems is that for designers and, and clients and people to actually understand carbon and understand construction. And what I mean by that is that what we're coming up against is people said, oh, reduce your carbon and to do that, you put loads of GGBS into your mix, okay? And this is like we would say in Ireland, first class. You know, you learned that in first class, but unfortunately, we're in sixth class. And uh, you cannot jump from first class to sixth class without going to second, third, fourth, and fifth. And I've started a campaign now to try and bring that together. And I can only prove that through testing. So the point I'm trying to make, I mentioned chloride migration, and I also want to talk about kind of just generally testing and testing of materials, that I'm just throwing this out there that people have to be aware that if you start changing a proven process that's been developed in, in the UK and in Rome for hundreds of years using cement and concrete, we have to have balance between carbon and actual performance. So if we introduce new materials, then how are they performing? And, and I can tell you now, they perform differently. So if you, I, I don't bore people in this conversation, but if you replace cement, a SEM1 cement with 60% GGBS, then it might perform better from a durability point of view, but it may not perform better from a performance point of view. And the only way to prove that is through testing. And these are the things that we're finding. And that's why we're focusing a lot on R&D and a lot on the lab. Carbon, in some respects, is just a by the way, because the construction, the concrete, the material, it has to be built to last. And that's where we're starting from. It's coming back from that, but bringing the carbon agenda with it. Now, I hope that didn't confuse you, Kat. And didn't, no, uh, and, for, and for those on the call, um, <laughs> EPD stands for Environmental Product Declaration. So um, uh, you can look at more information on that side. No, I think you make a, an interesting point, but I want to bring in uh, Andy Kane here because the need for testing and also being clear as to how products perform, what they're there to do, and when you're swapping things out from a carbon reduction hierarchy perspective, it will have an impact in terms of, uh, as, as Peter and others have said, you know, how actually that material operates in practice, how long it will last. So you mentioned in, in your presentation from an insurance perspective, losses. But actually what we're seeing is a lot of changes happening across industry. We're getting more transparency as to where products are coming from, actually the, the transparency around the data and evidence. But are we still in a position whereby there's a, a lack of trust and uncertainty from an insurance perspective? So we're not breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. We're just looking at an overall loss and therefore we're all impacted. Well, I, I mean, I think that's a, a good question, Kat. And it's been, uh, uh, the insurance industry works on data and on historic data. You know, that is how we calculate what we charge for um, the transfer of risk in the premiums that we charge. So we've already heard from, you know, a number of the panelists um, today and speakers about that lack of long term data. Um, but I think what's really positive is the, the 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 focus that I've also heard on, you know, the longevity, performance, safety that have been mentioned um, as being the priority. Um, I think the challenge the challenge for the insurance industry is that there are the, the things that we we're concerned about are um, 
an unknown risk and systemic risk. And if we look at it, you know, examples, we've already heard about the uh, SALT um, issue back in the 60s. Um, UK is now dealing with um, a systemic issue around reinforced autoclave aerated concrete in schools and the number of schools that have got that issue in it now. Um, so we're very concerned about those issues in the future. Um, and the only way that we can really get that confidence is through engagement with the industry bodies, with clients, with manufacturers. Um, you know, and we, uh, uh, we use our, our in-house engineers and external specialist consultants to review the designs, the, the proposals. Um, you know, we'll go on, on, on site into manufacturing facilities to witness, um, you know, the curing and the testing, look at the test, uh, um, the test results. But this is quite a, a, a fast moving um, uh, uh, state of the industry where we've got a lot of these changes. And what we really don't like is people saying we're going to use much less concrete in a design and we're going to use a different type of concrete um, and we've got no historic data for it. Will you please insure us for the next 15 years? Give us a warranty. Um, that's a just, concern for us. Yeah. So, just, so just challenging that because it, I, I think the way obviously the insurance industry is taken forward by looking at historic data. When you're looking at innovation, a lot of historic information is not there. You have to look at how yeah. um, the product uh, is intended to be performed, actually the monitoring and the evaluation ongoing. So if you're constantly looking back, we're never going to be able to move forward as an industry yeah, and be absolutely. more proactive. So is there an element in terms of actually the um, insurance industry actually using approaches and practices, which is about historic risk, not about managing risk proactively going forward and taking a different viewpoint because yeah. ultimately we will never get anything new off the ground and it will always be a, a barrier to actually different performance. Uh, we, uh, Kat, there's always been innovation. Um, in, and, you know, this isn't new. Um, the engineering insurance industry um, has dealt with innovation since it came into um you know, it came into being in the in the in industrial revolution um, when steam engines were produced and it responded to a need. So the insurance industry will respond, but what we need is early engagement, um, sharing of, of data, transparency, and, and understand that this is a, a process and a journey mm. um, that everybody needs to go on together. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I just want to bring you in here, Andy Malone, in terms of the the low carbon concrete group and and. The, the new work um, work stream that's coming up in terms of industry and the insurance companies working together. Yeah, so I mean, I've listened to uh, uh, Peter and Andy, uh, and um, been wanting to to chime in with a with, with a few comments. So, so uh, I'm going to try not to make this sound like a moan or, or point in the finger, uh, but certainly collaboration and and uh, transfer of knowledge across everybody who's working within. The construction industry or supports the construction industry is key and we do have some significant hurdles to get over now uh, but in but in terms of uh, innovation uh, and, the, and the perceived risks i say perceived that there are risks uh, with innovative products but um, fundamentally um, i haven't heard of any innovative um, products being the cause of any structural failures in the last 20 years. They're all, they're all Portland cement based in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, high aluminum cement wasn't a, a low carbon concrete. Um, reinforced autoclave aerated concrete isn't a low carbon concrete. So first and foremost, I think we need to disentangle definitions and references. You know, what is a risk? What is a lower carbon concrete? What is an innovation? What is new? What is old? Uh, and so forth. Because when you talk to different people with different biases, uh, you get. I'm not sure if it's just me. Um... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. sound from me, Andy. Yeah, no, no. no it's good for me. Good. So, yeah. yeah. But depending on who you talk to, 
uh, and who you listen to, they, they, they have a different interpretation of what a, a low or lower carbon, what is an innovation, what is uh, a risk and, and what isn't a risk. What we do need uh, is to work with um, people like Andy, well, myself and Peter and Andy Powell need to work with people like uh, Andy Kane and those um, uh, surveyors and structural engineers who Andy goes to for advice on how they're interpreting what they're being presented. Because a month ago, I sat in a room of uh, uh, surveyors and structural engineers who work in the insurance sector, and they have a very narrow view of, um, of what they would refer to uh, for guidance in, in demonstrating whether they could provide warranties or not. So, so that's a challenge. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just a narrow view. But the construction industry needs to support Andy and the wider insurance sector in order to enable these innovations to, to progress. Maybe just one last question um, from David Simons. Um, most problems with concrete concern the effects caused by corrosion. Um, and the main driver that requires high cement contents to satisfy the durability requirements given is in uh, BS8500. Why are alternatives to conventional steel reinforcement, such as GRP and, and basal fiber, not investigated more for more general acceptance? Don't know if anyone wants to try and answer that question. Dirk, Dirk, I was I was slightly hitting on that in my presentation. Yeah, uh, that's that's something we're working on the whole time. Um, as I said, we probably were the first people to produce a pre-stressed basalt fiber bar. You know, to, so to look at the the opportunity to produce a pre-stressed flooring slab instead of a typical hollow core, which has got standard re uh, strand rebar inside. So um, the the unfortunate thing is, and it goes back to probably our insurance man Andy. Um, you, you can do loads and loads of things which we're trying to do and you can present the information and you can present the results but somebody has to sign off on it and uh, so codes uh, specifications they have to kind of keep up they have to be aligned with the insurance industry because that's the world we live in and uh, so well I might try to convince everybody in this webinar that basalt fiber pre-stressing can be done and it's a great job um, how do I prove it you know, and uh, so these things, uh, as I said, Portland, the cement companies don't have to prove Portland cement. That's proven itself for hundreds of years. So uh, any new additions, I think we've touched on it. It takes time, but you have to be chipping, chipping, chipping. And that's why I just touched on the, the, the basalt, the, the GFRP. There are things that we do we, where we have the opportunity to use those where there isn't a kind of an insurance situation, uh, we use them where there's a corrosion, uh, a cover situation, th you know, different things. Uh, we've been able to squeeze it in, but it's a long road uh, to getting the, all, all these kind of alternatives approved and accepted. So it's a difficult one, but all we can do is, as, as an industry is try to try to get there. You know, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, I could come in quickly yeah. if possible. Yeah, I was just on that, that um... That last question, um, I'll be very brief and ju just to say that, yeah, no, that's ab absolutely um, the sort of thing, the alternative reinforcements that um, that clients are looking at. I know, you know, the Environment Agency particularly looking at that because um, a lot of our um, construction activities are in the water environment, particularly in the coastal environment. So corrosion uh, is a real, real issue. And um, yeah, we've been um, well, we've been doing some some trials again with um uh, with the likes of FRP and, and basalt uh, fibre reinforcement, um, which are, you know, uh, are getting us in the right direction. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we, we've still got a long way to go as far as making it easy. So it, it, it seems like each time um, we have to sort of go back to basic engineering principles because in the absence of the sort of UK codes, we're using American codes, uh, the different products, behave differently so it's not a sort of one one sort of methodology approach so but but there's you know there's things that we can do to make that easier but we've got some really good examples where we've done uh, sort of you know precast um, 
um, um, sort of ultra low carbon concretes with AACMs combined with the uh, alternative reinforcements um, and uh, sort of showing that you can precast these, um, but, but equally we need to make that journey easier for project teams. Andy, Andy, can I just cut in? I know we're stuck for time, but just going back to the point you're making, they, I would encourage you to look up uhdc.eu, which is the research we're doing on ultra high durability concrete. And the emphasis, again, is stick with what's known. We're using cement. We know it works. But what can we do to make it better? Uh, so that, that's kind of the approach where and we're looking at stuff on the nano scale. So nanocellulars, nanosilicates. So we kind of go, look at, you know, cement. We know it. So we, we, have, a good, we have a good foundation. We'll work with that. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to produce a very resistant concrete. So now by producing a more resistant concrete, then we can reduce the cover, we can reduce the section. And albeit that there might be rebar inside, but guess what? It's going to take 150 years before potentially something kind of corrosion will get there. So look, it's there's different approaches to answer that question, uh, Kat or Dirk. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a committee like this. Super. Right, I'll just want to draw the Q&A to a close and thanks everybody for their presentations and their panel input. Um, just in summary, um, just like to say thanks to all of our presenters, Andy in terms of providing that overview and the progress from a low carbon concrete route map perspective and the work that's um, started or upcoming. Said from a client perspective in terms of covering what it means for a NASA owner and operator and that application specific requirement that's needed. Ken, from a consultancy perspective um, and understanding that, you know, even the application of a carbon reduction hierarchy can have additional benefits and what that means in terms of whole life carbon and build off site um, activities. And there's a report available on that side as well. Andy Kane from an insurance perspective and actually understanding where that risk comes from, what we can do to reduce that and support industry movement. Um, Oliver, from a practical perspective in terms of what it means on a project and how we can actually improve performance going forward and having more of a tagging and tracking approach and using digitization effectively. Um, Peter, from a sustainability journey as an organization moving forward, um, not just for themselves, but actually from an industry wide um, improvement and what they can do more in terms of moving closer to the customer but also looking at technology and design life uh, and monitoring that going forward and what that means from a living lab perspective. I think there's a, an element in terms of us collectively having more collaboration, more transparency around data and evidence. And, you know, Andy Powell has also shown in terms of what we can do from a, a client perspective and what the EA are doing. But really, it's this is a constant moving feast. It's about managing risk as we go forward. It's about looking at what we can do with our existing materials and our processes and actually using that alongside innovation and change, changing practices, that change management that needs to go with moving a industry forward with a collective aim to reduce carbon. So hopefully I've not missed anybody out. Sorry for the failure of in terms of the screen earlier on, but over to you, Dirk, for final words. Uh, thanks very much, Kat, for um, really well summing up what we've just been discussing and and i think there's definitely food for thought um and the scope for few future discussions which we could also uh i i suggest continue on site you can see from the upcoming uh visits that we've got planned we, we have quite a few in the pipeline we're going to a number of uh factories in the next few months where we would love to uh network and and have more peer uh, discussions amongst yourselves so do, do keep our events in mind going forward but I, I just want to again thank Kat for ably chairing the event and um, I really do think we've managed to bring together some really good strategic uh, practical and scientific insights uh, which which are worthy of further further discussion so uh, as our groups Managing Construction Risk, Net Zero Carbon Forum, and Bill of Sight, we will continue these discussions and we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to contribute to them as well. Do give us some feedback as well on today's webinar. Um, my colleague Charlotte will most probably be sending you a survey quite soon, um, trying to hear from your webinar experience, building on that, trying to improve things, but also hearing any suggestions for future webinars. If we haven't covered all your questions, do pop them over to Charlotte and we will try and get some of the speakers to respond to them. 
Um, and last but not least, um, as as Kat said, there was so much content, some fantastic high quality content. You'll want to digest it. We will send you the links to the presentations provided we have speaker consent and the recording will also be made available to you. Um, so I'll um, bring the um, session to a close and just a very big thank you again for the chair and speakers providing their time and efforts in putting this all together for us. And uh, a big thank you and applause to you all. Thanks very much for being here with us and thank you for the attendees as well. Thank See you, you soon. Thanks again, everyone.